Man, we're going to jump into this thing because I'm excited um, for what I believe God's got for us. Um, So getting to be a pastor, I get to be a part of a lot of weddings and funerals and kind of that whole play out. And if you spend any time around me, you very quickly realize I'm a weird dude. (laughs) I am. I'm just a goofy, unique human being, and I love it. Um, But one of the ways that I'm very weird and I've come to realize is that I'm one of a few pastors that actually like funerals more than weddings. Now, that sounds terrible. I'm not a psychopath. Let me explain it. I think that funerals are, while they are sad that we're losing people we love, they're also equally amazing because we get to remember the best of individuals. And we get to sit down and we get to talk about all of our favorite memories and the moments that mattered most to us and the achievements of their lives and the great things that they did. It puts us in this position where we're like remembering all the most amazing things But what funerals communicate to me is that I think our life in general is pretty much summed up in moments. Let me prove it to you. If I asked you to tell me about your childhood, you wouldn't tell me every lunch your mom made for you. But you would remember all the great moments, the vacations, the trips, the Christmases, the the birthdays, all of what played out. And so I think in our lives, we really realize that there are a few key moments that change everything, (laughs) that they direct and shift who we are and who we become. And I want you to realize I think we're in one that I think five years, 10 years, 20 years from now, you're never going to forget 2020. Like, this is a year for the history books. There's going to be whole chapters written about just this. And we're only halfway through, so there's more to come. (laughs) And I think what's cool is, is we get afforded something you don't always get in life, and that's you realize you're in one. Right, one of my favorite scenes in the office is the moment where Dwight, or, or Andy says at the end, I wish we could remember that we're in the good old times. We're in the good old times. I think we know we're in a moment. And what I have found in my life is the difference between the moments in my life where I feel like, dude, I killed it. I got all God had for me. Like, I passed the test. I learned what I needed to learn. Like, I'm better for that. Versus the times where it's like, yeah, I left some meat on the bone. (laughs) I'm probably going to have to retake that test. Did not learn what I needed to learn. I'm not looking forward to the next go around on that. I found the difference between the two is when I had room to hear God. That the difference between when I feel like I got all God had for me versus I know I didn't lay hold of everything, was whether or not there was space in my life to hear his voice. Whether or not I had room to to hear what God was trying to say to me. And I think today that leads me to the title of my message, and that is make room. I think at our little bit past halfway point, this is a time for us to realize we've got to make some room. That there are some things God's trying to get to us, things God's trying to do to us, things God's trying to show us that we just got to create some room for Right, like uh, we, there's some things God's trying to do that if we could just pause a little bit longer, have some space, some quiet time, we might hear God say a few different things. Right, we're going to see that we're a little different six months from now than we are today. And I think there are two ways that you make room in your life. And I think the first one is just intentionality. I think you decide I'm making room, and no matter what's happening, no matter how ca- crazy or busy or caught up in stuff I am, I am making room for Jesus. And I think one of my favorite stories in Scripture where that happens is the story of Mary and Martha. You see, Jesus and his disciples, they're kicking it, right? They're doing their thing, and uh, they stop by Martha's home. And Martha welcomes them in, and she starts preparing everything and getting dinner ready and dishes and all of it. You know what I'm saying? She's getting this thing hooked up like, Jesus is here, y'all. Y'all better make that right. Anybody in here like, no one's coming to your house until it's exactly spotless. Let me see some hands. Okay, I'm, I'm proud of the ones of you who didn't. My wife, however, is not one. You are not coming over unless it's right. I'm like, you know, let me, I'm lying to you. I'm more that way than she is. I really just want my house clean. Uh, anyways, uh, I don't know how I got there. The point is, is Martha is making everything right. And then you find Mary, and she's like straight chilling. <laughs> like, Martha's making dinner, getting everything prepared, and you find Mary hanging out at Jesus' feet. And uh, then you find Martha, who's like now officially p- perturbed to say the least. And so let's catch up with where that happens. It's Luke chapter 10, verse 41. It reads like this. Jesus is speaking. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. I don't know about y'all, but when someone says my name twice, I know I've missed something. My mom has had to say my name more than once a few times in my life. Uh, And uh, so it says, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. And Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. My question for you is, if God spoke to you right now, could you hear him? (laughs) 
Or do you find yourself like Mary and where I found myself recently, so caught up in trying to figure this out and figure that out and busy doing this and busy doing that? But like, honestly, I don't have time to hear from God. Like, prepping for this message made a few things very abundantly clear in my life. And that was I needed to create some room. That I found myself so caught up in the weeds that I didn't have time to hear what he was really saying to me. That I was so busy trying to get things the way I think they should be or the way that they should look or acceptable enough that I wasn't asking God, what are you trying to do in my life? You see, I mean, verse 42 says, but few things are needed or indeed only one. And Mary has chosen what is better. The truth is, is that Mary's really just upset because Jesus isn't making important what Mary, or what, excuse me, Martha's upset because Jesus isn't making important what Martha thinks is important. Right? She's like, I'm clean. I'm getting all this right. Like, she's so caught up in making life the way that she thinks it should look that she's missing Jesus. And you've got Mary who realizes that none of this actually matters. Whether the dishes are clean, whether the house is right, whether I've got all my I's dotted, my T's crossed, none of that matters. What matters is the fact that Jesus is speaking that Jesus is in front of me, and that I have room right now to be able to hear what God has to say to me, and I'm going to listen. I don't know about you, for I know for me, in my life, the times I am most frustrated with God are when he's not listening to my plan. Right? right. Like, like, I feel like far too many times in my life, my life is essentially summed up, and I've got the wheel, I'm chilling, big chilling. That's what PR says. And uh, I'm big chilling. And I've got some snacks right here in the passenger seat. I haven't got just a Gatorade. Like, it's comfy, y'all. He did see if I, in my, you know, fake world, he did see, like, he's chilling. And I'm like, all I need you to do, Jesus, is just say yes and okay. And we're going to get there just fine. But that's not how it plays. Because I don't get to see tomorrow. I don't get to know what God has in store for me. I don't got to know what God's got coming up or what's about to happen. And so I've spent way too much of my life basically asking Jesus to co-sign my plan Versus asking him, God, what do you have for me? God, what are you saying to me? God, what are you trying to show me? God, what are you trying to get to me, speak to me? God, what are you trying to put in me in this season of life? Versus, it'd be really cool if you would just do what I want. <laughs> and so I found myself kind of wrestling through that. And the question is, how do we make room? Like, what does that look like? I know for you T's and type A's, you're like, cool, bro, it's ethereal. I like the sound of make room for Jesus. What does that look like? I think it's simple, but hard, right? I think it looks just as simple as reading your Bible. Now I know you're like, well, I'm not a reader, da, 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 da. That's okay, that's cool. We ain't got to start at like a chapter a day. How about you just log on to the app for five seconds and read the verse of the day? It's free, doesn't cost you anything. It's a very simple sentence that might change your whole week, right? Or maybe for you, it's like just making church a priority. There's a lot to be distracted by. I get it, I'm with you. I found myself there. But this matters. Like being in a room of people who believe in Jesus and are encouraging you, it matters. This moment right here where you're in your seat, it matters. Like God is speaking to you in whatever way that looks like, whether it's worship, whether it's the preaching, or whether it's just you hug somebody and you needed to hug. But it matters. And maybe you're online and you're like, cool, but like, what about us? <laughs> I get it. I understand. You can't come right now. You're sick or afraid to be sick or a million reasons why you can't be here. What I want you to realize is it matters for you too. What it looks like for you is the next time that notification comes by or the next time that text message happens, you just ignore it. But you don't break your focus for this next 30 minutes. But you get all that God has for you. You listen to every word. You take every note you need to so that for the rest of your week, you're ready for what God has in store for you. It matters for you. Maybe for you, it looks like serving. God has been really, really good to you. He's done some things in you. And what you need to know is anything God has ever done for you is not just for you. But there are people on this planet, in this world, that need you, need your story, and need your gift. And you have an obligation when it comes to following Jesus to find ways to share what he's done for you. So that could look like serving on the front door in a red shirt, high-fiving people, or if they ain't got a green band, just smiling at them, making them feel welcome. Maybe it looks like for you being a part of Life Kids and realizing we have no idea what those kids are going home to. But for that hour, we get to show peace. For that hour, we know they walk away loved. Maybe for you, it looks like realizing that you can't come in person. So then you start creating watch parties. And you invite your friends. And you make sure that this church is global, not just local. That everyone in your life gets to realize how much you love Jesus. Maybe it looks like reaching out and asking, how do I get to be a part? How do I, how do I serve in church online? There's a million ways, but what's true is there's something in you. 
that God in heaven and the universe didn't make you to just exist, but there's purpose, there's calling, and there's something he wants to pull out. Absolutely. I think another way it looks like is worship. This is my personal favorite way. Dude, there's something about being in a shower and that song comes on. Right? If no one knows you're crying, you're already wet. <laughs> there's something about that moment. But also, there are some times that you don't know what to pray. So you just get in agreement with a song. Maybe you feel like praying is difficult and it's hard and it's ethereal. And it's like, no, no, no I'm just going to stand here. I'm going to worship. I'm going to say, this song, this, me, God, yeah, this, me to you, right here. <laughs> it seems silly, but it's true. And God can do in seconds what we can't do in lifetimes. One song, one moment could change you forever. So the challenge is, is to not be Martha, but to find ways to become Mary. To not make excuses for why we can't get to Jesus or why we're too busy for him, but to get creative in how we make room for him. And to realize it's not so much what you do, but it's that you do. Like, it doesn't matter how you make room. What matters is that you make room. It's going to look different for everybody. Right? I can't sing. I wish I could, but I can't. So I'm not going to get up here singing and make room that way. I mean, if Trev lets me, I will. Uh, <laughs> but for real, what matters is that we make room, that we determine in our hearts that come hell or high water, no matter how crazy life is or how busy we are, we have space for Jesus. The other way that I think room gets made is I think it gets made for us. Here's what I mean by that. I think sometimes life just punches you in the throat. And maybe you're sitting in the seat in 2020. Is that for you? Every plan you thought you had just got set in flame. I have the quote that I like from a guy named Jim Cimbala, it reads like this. Trouble is one of God's great servants because it reminds us how much we continually need him. I'm going to read it again because I want you to grasp it. Trouble is one of God's great servants because it reminds us how much we continually need him need him. Here's what's true. When you have someone in your life that's sick and the medicine doesn't seem to be working and the doctors don't seem like they know what to do and you feel like you're lost, you don't need someone to tell you you need God. It's clear. Right? When you feel like you've, when you've lost your job or the bills are piling up and you don't know how you're going to get the next rent check paid and you don't know where it's going to come from or how it's going to happen, you don't need someone to tell you you need Jesus. It's clear. Right, when you're at home way more than you've ever been because of quarantine or COVID, and now you realize, do we like each other? <laughs> like, I thought we were cool, but man, like, it feels like I want to choke you, and you definitely want to choke me. You don't need someone to tell you you need Jesus. It's clear. And here's what's true in life, is that when life gets hard, and we don't know where to go, and we don't know what to do, it puts us in this place where we realize we can't do it solo, that we need Jesus desperately. And in that moment, in the place where you find that truth, there's room. When you realize you've turned every t stone over you know to turn, and it didn't fix it, there's room. One of my favorite stories in Scripture is found in Luke, and it's the, or excuse me, in Mark, and it's the story of the woman with the issue of blood. And what happens is, is it says there's this woman, and she's been sick for 12 years. Everybody say 12 years. 12 years. Not 12 days. Not 12 weeks, not 12 months. This woman's been sick for a minute. And it says that she spent everything she had. She has gone to every doctor, every physician. She's tried every essential oil you can try. Like, none of it's fixing anything. She's just sick, and she's broken, and she has absolutely nothing left. And then she hears Jesus is coming. And she realizes, it's my last chance. If anybody can do it, it's him. If I could just get to him. I know it's nothing's worked before, but if I could just get to him, something could happen. I could find my healing. I could find my breakthrough. And she does. And she pushes through a crowd. She chases Jesus down. And she lays hold of his clothes. And it says immediately she's made whole. Let's catch up with the story in Mark chapter 5, verse 33. It reads like this. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet. And trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. I don't know why, 
that sometimes it feels like all you have to do is say one prayer and the answer's there. Versus why sometimes it feels like you've been praying your whole life and you still haven't got the answer. There's a lot of variables. There's a lot of reasons why that happens. But what I do know is, is that there are some times in life where you just have to decide this is who I follow. This is what I believe. And no matter what my body says, no matter what my world says, no matter what this looks like, I am following him. And no matter how many times I have to chase him down, no matter how long I have to make room, I will be there until I get my breakthrough. Until I have my healing, until I find that thing that I need, I'll be there. I wish I could tell you 2 plus 2 equals 4. You say your prayer this way and it'll happen, but sometimes it just doesn't. But something does happen when you decide in your heart, I'm digging my heels in. My God is God. And I will fight until I don't have breath to get the breakthrough I need. There are just some times in life where your decision to not quit gets the breakthrough. That your healing, that your need being met, it happens on the other side of your decision to not stop. She had every excuse in the world to quit, and she didn't. She fought through crowds, chased young men down while she was sick for 12 years, and she got her healing. My challenge for you is not to stop. No matter how hard it feels, no matter how bleak it seems, God has something special. I don't just believe it because I've seen it in pages. I've seen it in my life. Seeing God do things that I wouldn't know how he could do, and he did them. Many of you know my mom. (laughs) It's not easy the second time preaching it. She's so incredible. She's one of the kindest, most amazing women on the planet. To know her is to know what love feels like. Like, she's incredible. I've seen my mom fight my whole life to provide for us and to make sure that me and my brother had everything we needed. Right now, she serves and she's killing it. But what's true is, is that she's had her own fight. And for my whole life, my mom has a fight, a battle with addiction. And it all came to a head when I was 16. You see, my mom got another DUI. And because that happened, the state took us out of our home. And what happens is, is when the state takes you from your family, for whatever reason, <laughs> typically, they go and find your next of kin. <laughs> When they take you to them and you stay with them until whatever that program looks like. <clears throat> so they go to my grandma's house. And it's me and it's my brother and we're standing on the front porch and the cops are behind us and they ask my grandma if she would take us in. And my grandma looks at me and then she looks at my brother and she says, I'll take him but I don't want him. I can't. It's too much. It's too hard to deal with whatever and In that moment, everything I knew was robbed from me. I'm sitting in the back of a car in a cop police vehicle, and all I know is I'm alone. There's no thing. There's no other family to go to. Like, I'm solo now. My family didn't want me. I don't even know how to explain to you, like, how much that hurts and what that felt like to realize your own family didn't think that they had time for you. And what's crazy is the story doesn't stop there. I get put in foster care, and every home feels like it's worse than the next. I mean, the first home I'm in, and it's, you got to eat food at this time. You're going to eat this kind of food. This is the window of time you eat. Like, guys, I'm fluffy. <laughs> I need food. It was crazy. And the next home, it's me, and it's like eight other teenage boys, and we're in a basement. And the basement is full of black mold. And every day we're sick coughing, hacking, sneezing, and no human being should have lived in that basement, let alone eight teenage boys. Let me get taken from that home. And I go to the third one, and the third one is this outside all day long in the middle of the summer. We're not allowed to come in. All we can do is manual labor or whatever odd jobs they have for us. We don't even get to eat inside. Our lunch and our dinner is given to us out on the back porch. And the only time we're allowed to come in is when it's time to sleep. And in that room, it's me and two other teenage boys, and we are like sardines. Again, I'm fluffy. There ain't that much room to begin with. And we're in there. And all I know is my life sucks. That if God is real, where is he at? Like, I was trying to do church at the time, and it felt like I was endeavoring to get close to God, and then all hell broke loose. I was so mad. 
and I had so many questions that I didn't have answers to, but here's what I do know. Is that when God feels most absent, he is most present. <laughs> that oftentimes in your life, where you feel like God can't hear you, and you can't hear his voice, he's doing his best work. That at the end of that rope, there's room. There's space for Jesus to do what only he can do. And what I realized is I don't have a whole lot of scripture at 16, uh, and, but I did have one memory verse. That Shout out to Darla. She's the one who taught me it. It was Romans 8, 28. And it reads like this. And we know with great confidence that God, who is deeply concerned about us, causes all things to work together as a plan for good for those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. I didn't know how. But I knew that if God existed, he could do something. I was alone, and I had nothing. And there was no other place to go. Like, I had room. God, I need you. And if you're real, please show up. And then God did what God did. He started moving things around. He started working. And I got moved from Poto, Oklahoma to a home in Eufaula, and I was closer to home. And the youth pastor at the church that I'd gone to <clears throat> for just a short while decided that he was going to make a way for me to get to church. That youth pastor is our hosting, Pastor Ryan Gray. <laughs> He didn't just get me to church. He decided that he'd let me live with him. And everything that I thought said I wasn't loved, and everything I thought that said I didn't matter, I had someone in front of me who wanted the best for me, who believed in me, who saw something in me, who loved me. I got to be in his home and see what peace looked like, that it wasn't a myth, but that it could exist. I saw the way that he loved his family and the way that he followed God and the way he pursued Jesus. And it woke something up in me that said, I don't know how and I don't know what it's going to look like, but I will die before I don't let people know what he did for me. I will spend the rest of my life letting you know Letting you know and letting anybody know that no matter how dark it feels, no matter how nasty that backdrop is, God can paint a masterpiece. That he works all things together for the good of those who love him. <laughs> and then there were things that I missed. While I was in state custody, my best friend at the time got arrested for selling drugs. <laughs> I spent every moment with him. And there is absolutely no doubt that I've been shoulder to shoulder with him, that when he got the cuffs, I would have. I didn't go to jail. While I was in state's custody, my grandpa took his life. I would have been home for that. That would have broken things in me that I don't know how anyone could fix but I wasn't. Because God was doing things I didn't know. I believe with all of my heart that there are times in life where God is answering prayers you don't know to ask. That no matter how hard it feels, no matter how dark it seems, no matter what that tunnel looks like for you, God is doing something. And if we could just purpose in our heart that we're going to make room, that we're going to decide to wait on God until our thing hits, till that breakthrough comes, we'll realize I'm standing here at 26 years old with no criminal record. with a mom that is healthy and sober and serving in the church. <laughs> Married to the most amazing woman. Yeah, y'all clap for her. With three incredible kids. <laughs> and I am madly in love with Jesus. And I will spend the rest of my life for moments like this. 
places where I can let you know that no matter what it feels like, God's got something that He is working right now. And I promise you, it will change your life. If you could just purpose in your heart, I'm going to make room. So whether you're Martha and you are so busy and you feel like you can't hear God because you can't see the forest for the trees, or you feel like you're the one with the issue of blood and everything you've tried didn't work and now you're alone and you're at the bottom of your hole and you feel like there's no arm long enough to reach you, let me let you know, God can. And the answer is the same for both and it is Jesus. That your decision to make room, to wait on God, to quiet life so you can hear his voice will do things that you couldn't know to ask. So maybe it looks like serving. Maybe it looks like deciding you're going to be a part of the body again. That you won't make excuses, but you'll be here. Maybe it looks like just worshiping because you've had so many things God's done for you. Or maybe it's just being quiet so that God can speak. But I want you to realize that God is here now and that this is a moment. And that today, in this moment, you can decide that 2020 is not going to be the anchor around my weight that sinks me into the deepest ocean, but it will be the platform that sets me on the path of everything that God has for me. Will you make room? Will you lean into Jesus and decide no matter what, I will not stop until I get what he has for me? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for a group of people that love you and need you. If you're in this room today and you realize, dude, this message was for you, that you're like me and you have found yourself caught in the weeds or you just realize, like, man, life is hard. You don't know what to do, but you know you need Jesus. If you're in here and you're like, all right, pray for me. I want to make room. I want to know what that looks like for me. I want to be able to take a step. I want to get closer to Jesus so I can hear, hear what he has for me. That you just raise that hand. I'd love to pray with you. Absolutely. Hands going up all over the place. God, we thank you so much for how good you are. That right now, God, you're giving us creative, unique ways specifically tailored to us to show us how we can make room for you. God, that we would carve out whatever it needs to look like so that you could get to us what you have for us. Father, we thank you in advance, God, because there are dreams, there are callings, there are gifts coming to the surface right now as we make room for you. Father, we thank you that people will never be the same because of what you wake inside of us. In Jesus' name, amen. With the head still bowed and eyes still closed, there's one more group of people in here. Yes, 2020 is a moment, but right now is a moment. All of your life has led to this moment in time. You realize you don't have a relationship with Jesus. This is that spot. Listen, just like the woman with the issue of blood, just like my story, but more than that, look to the life of Jesus, and you will see a love that you'll never find anywhere else. A love that crawled up on a cross, that broke his body, that spilled his blood because he didn't want you and I to ever feel that pain. And that what's incredible is every day there's new mercy. Every day there's grace. Every moment of every time, God is just waiting for you to give him a second of time so that he'd come in and set you free. So today, if that's you and you've never trusted Jesus with your life, I want you to raise that hand and meet me eye to eye. 